One. Okay, quiet for a second. Two seconds of quiet. Last time we were like laughing when we started. Jonathan, can I get you to laugh at all? Depends what you do, Bill. You normally do something crazy. It's not a laughy day, is it? Brent, can you get him to laugh at all? <laughs> you want to borrow my dog? <laughs> See, I didn't have to say anything. That's just how I roll. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, two seconds uh, of quiet. Brett, welcome to Timelines of Success. Glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation, Bill. And we've got a third person out there hanging in on the uh, interview today. Is that Jonathan? It is me, Bill. I'm okay. here. For our timeliners, we have Jonathan here. Of course, we're going to do the second show, which is BluffTV.com. And I don't expect this show to go up until like 2015, early 15. But Jonathan, I guess your timeline interview, which will follow, excuse me, your WP Tonic, which will follow, will uh, go up before then. So without further ado, Brett, let's get into the conversation. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do as an entrepreneur, as a business person, and how you've evolved. Sure. So I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a father. I'm a husband. Uh, I spend I've spent the last 15 years uh, building a few different businesses, some of which have crashed and burned, some of which have been sold or acquired. Um, and, uh, and then I'm, I'm working on my current project, which is yougurus.com. Uh, we help web professionals build wildly successful businesses. Yeah, I was looking at that. You uh, tell us a little more about what you're doing right now with your you you grill as you you gurus you so gurus. Like gurus. Yeah, I saw it. You gurus. I got to bring you up on the website. You in yeah. front of it. You gurus. Uh, that's right. Yeah. So we um, we help web professionals build successful businesses. We do that through uh, a variety of different types of training. We have three primary pillars of our communities. Um, we basically have a community, or like what we like to call it, tribe. So we actually have some ways that we go a little bit deeper than just a regular internet community. Um, we, we try to help people to transcend the gap between them and their fellow uh, tribe members within our communities. Uh, then our second pillar is education. So we provide uh, a lot of video training, a lot of, um, we, we try to provide people uh, high value billable skills. So even though we teach web professionals, we're not really teaching them how to design and develop. We're teaching them how to um, actually uh, increase their value by helping their clients get a much larger ROI and by focusing more on what customers are really after versus just trying to build, you know, the the newest WordPress widget or HTML style or jQuery plugin. Uh, and then the third pillar of our community is mentorship. So we bring in, uh, we, we provide our community members with access to mentors. Uh, it's probably one of the things that makes us the most unique of any online community out there. Most websites where you go on there and learn, like lynda.com or Team Treehouse, it's just you and the videos. That's it, right? You don't really have access to the instructor. You don't have access to somebody else that maybe has access to the instructor. And so that mentorship factor is something that really has been setting us apart and has been helping the people that are in our communities achieve things that we never would have even close to dreamed of. So basically, you're working with the web professionals across the world for the most part, right? Yeah, we've got um, what, people what? in our Go ahead. I was going to say we've got people in our community, uh, a lot of North America, you know, the United States, Canada, um, but then a lot, a big representation in Australia, a big representation in uh, Europe, England, Scotland. Um, we've got some people in uh, Italy, uh, Singapore, um, had somebody from South Africa in a recent program. Um, somebody was in a very interesting place in China, which I can't even pronounce the name of the city. But uh, that was definitely probably our most remote person. So we've had people all over the world definitely in our programs. And, and you're out of Denver, correct? Yep. You're coming out of Denver today? Yep. Getting ready for the storm to hit you? <laughs> it's going to hit us first. I, I just got back from Aruba. So oh, wow. I am, uh, I, I am very uh, – I'm not yet ready to be in the cold or, or the really cold. So I, uh, I enjoyed a week of being out on a boat and – uh, on the beach, and uh, I'm not quite ready to to have winter, but uh, yeah, it's uh we're dead. we're based in Denver, Colorado. Our our whole team is. I take a wild guess that in Aruba, and when you're on the boat, you didn't have Wi-Fi. <laughs> a little bit, right? I mean, uh, you know, I I don't fully unplug 
too often. I, I try to at least once a year, but this this trip wasn't an unplugged trip. This was a, a trip with about 70 other entrepreneurs oh, nice. uh, called Maverick 1000. And so we were out there. Um, it's kind of a business adventures group. So there's, there's no shame in being in the middle of the ocean uh, in between rope swings out into the water where you check your email. That, that's pretty much expected. Everybody's on the same wavelength there. Right, right. That's kind of nice. Very nice. Very good. So quick, two quick questions. I'm going to let Jonathan ask a question. First of all, I sort of target, I work with the guys who have businesses, baby boomers, people coming up 40 plus into 70 who have businesses who are trying to do that first transition and they're scared of WordPress. How should I help them move their business into WordPress? For example, one restaurant we have got a WordPress site, started collecting addresses and started building a list. It's really helped them as a small restaurant. But they're scared of WordPress. I mean, they just don't know what to do. They hear, they don't know how to hire somebody, how to expand it. They're scared to death of what they're getting, that they won't, they'll pay a lot of money and they won't be able to use it. So just so I can be clear, you're basically curious with your audience. They're selling WordPress websites to baby boomer uh, business owners, be people that have yeah. restaurants or cafes or uh, uh, dry cleaners or right. whatever. Right, traditional, you know, brick and mortar businesses. But you know, you know, and I know that the web can bring in more traffic for them, more business. Well, I guess you know, my my mantra is you focus on what's important. Um, the technology is rarely the thing that they're really after. You know, nobody nobody ultimately wants a website or even WordPress for that matter. These are great tools. Uh, you know, nobody wants a hammer, right? They want a house. They want a shed. They want whatever that desired result is. And the tool is a means to an end. And so I think as a web professional, you have to really internalize that and be very, very cognizant good. that you're not selling the tool, right? You're selling the, the, the finished story benefit. You're selling whatever the customer is trying to achieve at the end of the day. And when you spend, you know, instead of spending 90% of your time talking to your customer about why WordPress isn't scary, you know, start talking to them about why they, you know, why you can help them to get more customers using the internet, why you can help them uh, reach more fans, why you can help them to increase their touch points to their customers and maybe increase the amount of transactions or the uh, per transaction value of of each of their customers that, that they're bringing to the table. So, you know, websites, I guess I've been in the game long enough to just know that, you know, the technologies come and go, but the ultimate uh, desire of our clients is always going to be the same. Like the number one problem a restaurant owner has is putting butts in seats. Like that's it. And if you can help them to do that, I guarantee you, they don't, they don't care if you're selling them pixie dust or a WordPress website with a traffic lead gen funnel and you're giving away uh, happy hour glasses of wine. Like they don't care if you get butts in the seats, they're going to sign that check all day long. Right, right, right. Hey, John, do you want to jump in with a follow-up question? Uh, <laughs> I don't really know. Um, but fundamentally, I don't know if you would agree with this, Brent. In some ways, the technology's got a bit simpler, but actually get a, a effective website. If you're a business owner that actually does what you've just said in some ways, it's got a little bit more complicated, hasn't it? Because the competition level has massively increased over the past six years, hasn't it? Right. So, like, everybody has a website, and rightfully so, every business should have a website. So, if there's, you know, 30 restaurants in a five-mile area, right, they all should have websites. They all should have good websites to talk about what they do and, and what they're what makes them unique. Um, but the the other side of that that coin, though, uh, John, is that the amount of people on the web and the amount of people on the internet or with internet connected devices has you know massively increased. Like there's over two and a half billion people on the internet. Like that's insane, you know. So while the total competition has definitely increased, so is the total amount of people on the web. Um, so, but but I think your your observation of some of the tools have become very plug and play. It's become easy. The barrier to entry to get online is becoming it's it's yeah. going lower and lower and lower and lower. Um, and I think to be to be actually attracting ideal customers using your website, you do have to be pretty savvy. Like building a website, super easy. Getting a thousand people a day to that website and then getting them to take some kind of action, 
that's a little bit harder. That's where you have to start being a little bit more strategic. You have to be using um, strategies and tactics that are are more universal than just websites. They're actually, you know, you're building personas, you're building lead gen funnels, you're creating offers and follow up sequences, and you're thinking right. about user experience and and what were all the interactions that somebody's going through on their website. I mean. I love that we are just throwing out restaurants, but I have seen many restaurant websites where you go to their site on a mobile phone, mobile phone, click on reserve a table, and it's like a 404 error. Yeah, you know, yeah, not good. So like, even though some of the tools are simple, it's also really easy to make some very glaring mistakes, and then it's super hard to develop a really well-oiled strategy. Right. Very good. Well, I'm going to ask you a couple more questions, and we'll get on to the next section. And what I'm going to ask you first is, you've had about 15 plus years of working with websites, at least, that I can see. You've had good times and bad times. What are some of your rough times you've had and had to get through them? And what caused them? <laughs> I mean, probably one of the first rough times, uh, I was like 19 or 20 years old. My business partner and I, we had started our business when we were 18, and we were working with a marketing company in a partnership. And our um, the partnership was basically we got a percentage of sales that came into the web. This is when the web was pretty early for the size of company we were working with. You know, e-commerce was pretty rare, um, but we basically built a, a website that sold these unique golf products. They were kind of like one of a, you know, these very kind of unique uh, golf products. One of them was like a switchblade uh, divot repair tool. And so our whole thing was bringing them online, and we got a percentage of online sales. Uh, the company, though, was basically taking the money they were earning – and they were robbing Peter to pay Paul. They basically weren't reinvesting anything in the website. They were funneling money out the back door. They weren't being uh, forward with us about how much money the website, how much they should be paying us, even though we could see the data. Like we knew how many sales, <laughs> we knew what they, what they, that what they owed us. Uh, and you know, it just it got super super sketchy. Like nobody wanted to pay each other. Emotions went super high, and you know, we ended up having to kind of like kind of like take all of our stuff in the middle of the night and like leave their office and kind of take down our servers and, and remove, like they just wouldn't pay us the money they owed us. And so we had to kind of pull the band aid. and uh, it was super high stress and like a lot of threats. And, and I think the lesson I learned there was really know who you're doing business with um, and uh, you know, be careful about getting too involved with people that promise you the world up front, right? The, the betting on the come, so to speak, like the guy that's like, oh, I'm going to give you a percentage of revenue, but I'm going to pay you nothing up front. You know, like be really, 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 really careful about that guy because anybody that doesn't have the money to pay you on day one, um, probably, you know, there's something wrong with that, right? Even though rev share sounds really enticing, I think a lot of freelancers fall into this trap where somebody promises them the world for them to slave away today, tomorrow, the next day in the promise or the hope that they're going to get some kind of payout or additional future projects somewhere down the road. So that was a big lesson that we learned. Like we literally wasted like probably six months of our lives working day in and day out on this project and we didn't end up making a dime on it. And to be 19, year old, 19 years old and to have that happen to you, um, you know, it just it, it left a pretty big mark for me. Very good. Very good. So. What's your best success? What what have you found to be the most successful things that you've done in your business? Oh man, um, I think probably you know building a great team. You know, a lot of people have a hard time hiring and expanding beyond themselves. And I've I've been fortunate enough to work with some really amazing people. Uh, we don't have a big team right now, but we have seven full time people and. Um, you know, we have the right people and the culture is like super tight. Um, we all, uh, you know, this team has pretty much been with me for five years, maybe. So we've, we were very, um, tight. We kind of know each other. We know what we expect out of each other. And I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, it's difficult to create that kind of a culture. Like a lot of people aspire to that culture. A lot of people talk about that culture, but very few companies I know of, um, really attain that really tight knit culture. And so I think I've been able to do that at least on a small scale. And over the next you know few years, we're definitely looking to, to scale up our company and grow organically and grow that that business and that enterprise. But I think probably building that team is probably one of the best things I've done. I was going to say congratulations. Holding people together for five years in this business is an accomplishment in itself. Well, and, and two of those people are actually like my business partner. We met in high school. 
And so we've been working together for 15 or 16 years. Wow. And then my CTO was the he was he sat next to me in junior year uh, high school computer science. And so we've like been together for like 17 years or something. And so, you know, we I, and I don't know what that means. I don't know if there's any kind of meaning there. I don't know if there's like if we're like something unique or special or we're headed for great things. I don't know. But I just know that we're still together as a team. We love working together. Um, we've done some amazing projects together. We've left companies, sold companies, and we've been able to keep a really good thing going. So yeah, that's good. That's tough, tough to do. Tough to do. Yeah. Well, driving on to our next section, I call it the bottom line up front. These are sort of my fun questions, really designed for people who aren't so much techie, but I sort of bring them into the tech field. I ask, well, what type of computer do you use? <laughs> I Mac am or a, PC? I, I'm a PC guy. So, um, you know, I got into to, to PC gaming way back in the day. Um, you know, when I first uh, got into computers, it just PCs were the thing that you could kind of pop the hood on and, and kind of break and mess up. And um, it, it never felt like that way with Macs. And so for me, you know, I just got into using PCs early on. And at this point, everything I do is web based. So right, right. I almost don't care. And, and I've actually even downsized recently. I use a, a Windows Surface. Um, just because, like, I was literally, like, having back problems from lugging around this, like, big, like, Lenovo ThinkPad for a long time. And so I just downsized. I basically use a tablet for my computer now. You have an um, i5 chip in that tablet? I think so. Yeah, 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 yeah the one with the apps. Yeah, the Surface but, Pro, yeah. yeah so sir, it's, that's it's a nice little tool. It is, and it has access to all your desktop apps. It can plug into a full monitor. So um, it's actually worked out really, really well for me. Uh, it has its things there's definitely some gotchas in the windows ecosystem right now um but it's it's allowed me to really run all the desktop applications i need to do but it's the size of of a of a tablet i'm going to follow up with a question so it's got some gotchas we won't get in trouble here but <laughs> the uh you know i sort of like the cons i like i'm a mac guy first of all but i like the concept of their operating system being on the pc or the tablet or the phone i sort of like that long-term concept what mm -hmm. are some of the gotchas what are some of the gotchas? So um, the resolution, if you have a, you know, it's if you're in the native resolution, it's really, really small. And the problem is if you hook up to a, a monitor, you need to be in the native resolution for the monitor to be in the native resolution. If you go, if you make the stuff on your surface bigger, it will mess up the native resolution. So it has a little bit of issue if you're plugging into a monitor, like the native resolution on the surface is almost too fine for most applications like it's every all the text is super small okay. um there's some issues with turning the power off so it has a button on there you can turn the power off and like depending on how the type pad cover moves it might trigger the auto on again even though i've turned that off in windows so like sometimes i'll open it up and like my battery's just dead even though like i left it fully charged so like there's some things like that um but overall it's it's pretty good it's just those couple of things with just the way the the surface technology is with like the it turning on even though you've like it needs a lock button like i've turned it off and i've locked it um kind of like what the ipad has um that way there's no way to turn it back on unless i'm ready to turn it back on Got so you. you know if you're traveling and you know i was just in miami and i landed or uh, i was i was about to take off or whatever and i i had fully charged my surface overnight and I'm literally getting on the plane hoping to write an email. I turn on my Surface and it's like completely dead. So like that's been something that's been really stressful. But so, so uh, did you pull out your you just pull out, nah? Did you pull out your smartphone? <laughs> no, I think I just read a book. And what I kind of okay? Book. What kind of smartphone do you have? Um, I have a an iPhone. So an iPhone? Okay. I've been on I've been on the the Apple I, the f iPhones for yeah. Uh, a while I, I doubt i'll go to even though we're all on google apps it's like our, our we've been on google apps since like 2007 and uh i i probably will i have had a, a, a android phone before like i had one of the original like g1s or something and uh after i went to an iphone it was just like i don't know they they just they, they do something at their little elf shop right they just <laughs> they they like get like the little transitions right and like everything yeah. just like feels so much smoother and i've watched people use like their samsung and their android phones and like they will get stuck on like a screen and it just like i don't know it looks frustrating yeah. to me now i we're uh, yeah the iphone's good so quick question jonathan we we're yeah. talking a little bit about jonathan and i have been going back and forth with the google apps mm. trying to use more and more of the google platform uh we're playing around with the uh google drive mm. 
Yeah, Jonathan, why don't you cue in on it? And that's what we're, we're looking at. I mean, we still have Dropbox, but I, I'd like to just use the Google Drive. Yeah, 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 you know, so. I mean, we're doing it. I mean, I'm trying to go to more Google Apps because I like Google Apps. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I use uh, I use Google Apps. I use Dropbox. Uh, you know, Google Apps is fantastic for just basic word processing, spreadsheets, the shareability, the the fact that all the documents are like a live document. Fantastic for collaboration. I mean, I I don't know how I would switch off of Gmail at this point. Like, I don't think I could ever go back to a premise based like install client like no. for email. Like, no it just way. it's not possible. So uh, I'm a, I'm a big advocate of Google Apps. I think they've done an amazing job with their product. I really like the interface between on Gmail on the iPhone, the smartphones, and everything. It just it's pretty amazing. Jonathan, any comments? No, not really. We've got our, our tech guy from <laughs> WP Tonic here in the backside of me. and Oh, my gosh. Okay, driving on, what are some of your favorite technologies? Um, That's a pretty broad question. What is your uh, favorite technology? Okay, there's one. What's it's one? Not, it's, not, it's not WordPress, is it? <laughs> Does the internet count as a technology? I guess, yeah, yeah. You can drill down a little bit further in the internet. Um. I, I'm a big fan of uh, of just SaaS as a broad uh, a broad uh, theme, right? I think every tool I use, I had a blog post on my personal blog maybe three or four months ago, the 27 tools I use to run my online business. And um, they're all SaaS, right? Everything that we use to run our business is SaaS. It's amazing. I can be in Aruba on a boat out in the middle of the ocean on my smartphone and I can, you know, uh, process transactions or partial refunds or give customers access or email like a JV affiliate person. You know, it's just like I can do everything I want from like my, my smartphone. So we do that through, you know, running our business on a variety of different software as a service platforms. Um, like I said, we run our business on 27 different SaaS platforms. Like that is, that's a lot. Right? That's so a lot I'm going to ask cool. you a little more detail on SaaS. Explain to my business guy who is just getting used to WordPress what SaaS is and how to use it. Uh. <laughs> That's where we go. That's where we start. That's where I'm starting. That's where I talk to guys. Oh, yeah, in, in, I'm the front you know, line. Like, like WordPress, I mean, when you think about it, it's it's still like, I mean, it's kind of a version of SaaS, right? I mean, you install a WordPress a hosting account on a server and it's a piece of software and it's running as a service. You can query it up anytime. You can access the admin, right? I mean, WordPress itself, now you are doing a premise install of it. You're installing it on your own server, but it is, it is. you could consider that it's your own SaaS tool. Now, traditionally, when people say SaaS, they're talking about, you know, software that's probably run by some company and it's, um, you know, you subscribe to it. Like, Correct, that's know, what I'm tools, thinking. Tools like... Uh, uh, MindMeister, um, you know, Recurly for subscriptions. Um, you know, there's there's uh, content management e-commerce systems like Shopify or BigCommerce that are SaaS based. Um, I mean, if you're looking at just in the web content management space, yeah, there's you know we consider WordPress like a premise system, right? But when I say SaaS, like I'm really thinking more of a globally saying, look, I have some software I've installed in a server, or I subscribe to a service that's installed in a server. It's not installed on my laptop. It's not installed on a computer in my closet at my house. Um, you know, being able to access those types of tools and get have those tools be updated and continuously being improved is to me, I think, what I, I think of when I think of a SaaS tool. Right. Okay. Very good. Very good. So next question is, we're going to talk now about what is your quote that motivates you most? What Do you have a quote you live by or it really motivates you? Um, you know, that's a good question. I'm, uh, I think the one I probably bring up most, and I, I'm thinking about this because I've included it in some, in some marketing emails over the last couple of years, is um, the Woody Allen quote, which is 80% uh, of life is showing up. And when you ask uh, Woody Allen what he meant by that, um, he basically means, look, it's it's just showing up is is like that thing that gets you most of the way there. So let's say you want to um, uh, you want to publish a book. Well, you know, to do that, you first have to write the book. Right. And if you write the book, you're 80 percent of the way there. Whereas a lot of people like well, they want to publish book, but they're like they don't write the book, right? They don't they don't do that thing, 
and they think about like the fact that you know publishing a book might be really it might seem really really hard to publish a book but if you first write the book you'd probably be very surprised at how actually easy it is to publish whether you're self publishing or whether you publish you know through an actual uh, you know a major right. publishing company so I, i've used that analogy a lot like you know a lot of people are worried about you know building a network or you know attending some kind of event they get or, or speaking in front of an audience. And let me tell you something. If you get in front of an audience and you've done the least bit of preparation, like you will speak, right? Like, you know, whereas if people are, are scared of doing that, if they're scared of showing up, then, it, you know, they're always going to be held back from achieving that thing. So if you want to speak in front of an audience, like you've got to, you know, get there, you have to show up to that point. You have to be able to get that, um, you know, build that presentation, build that hook. And then, to actually get up in front of an audience is, is really the easy part. So I think that that 80% of life uh, is just showing up is something that I, I bring up with people quite often. Brett, very good. So we're going to follow up. Who is your favorite author and uh, book? Do you have a tech book or a motivational book, business book? Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty avid reader. So I have kind of like my, my favorite books of the hour, right? Um, probably for in terms of entrepreneurship, um, one of the books that's been very fundamental for me in the last um, the last year uh, has been um, uh, Ash Maria's uh, Running Lean. I'm not sure if you're familiar with yes, that. Yes. If you're into product development or you're into creating businesses, I think Running Lean is a phenomenal approach to product development, and I've been using I've been a practitioner of that now for a year. And um, it's it's had an amazing impact on our businesses. And, and the, the second business book I'd recommend is a book called Traction uh, by Gino Wickman. Uh, and Traction is all about a system called Entrepreneur Operating System. It's a, uh, a way of life of running your business. It's, it's like I, I would call it a cult. If you want to run your business on EOS, it's kind of like joining a cult and, uh, or, or running a cult, really. And so Traction is if, if you have a team – and you're like, I don't know how to operate this business, and I don't want to invent a way to operate this business. I want to plug into something that already exists, and I don't want to build my own Frankenstein operational system. Um, traction is a, a fantastic first step down that path. So those will be on show notes at blufftv.com because it's going to be next year. And if it's this year, it's timelinesofsuccess.com. So in tying it all together, what do you enjoy doing when you're not working or programming or selling what do you enjoy doing? We know you went to Aruba, so you must have enjoyed that. But yeah, it's like we're, you're on like a work trip too, though. Yeah. I, uh, I have a five-month-old son, so I enjoy spending time with him and my wife. Uh, we read a lot. Um, we, don't really, we don't have TV at the house, so we spend a lot of time reading books and hanging out and journaling and uh, spending time with our five-month-old son. You really can't do much with him yet. He, he just kind of squawks and squeaks and and coos, but uh, it's still really cool to, to like watch him kind of take in the world and and figure things out and, and realize that like you know he's only been alive for five months. Like that's crazy. Like he only knows what he's seen in the last five months of the world, and so that's that's kind of probably the big thing that um, brings a lot of joy in my life. Give him an iPad. <laughs> or have you done that yet? No, we uh, you know the first two years are really important to to be careful about screen time and things like that. So we're we're working mostly with um, uh, like wooden toys and physical objects, and um, you know, like I mentioned, we don't have TV at the house, so we we really don't have haven't exposed him a lot to screen time. Um, obviously, that that will probably change as he gets a little bit older, but really trying to keep those those synapses in his brain. Um, uh, open and flexible to maintaining attention, and I and from what I know personally, you know I I grew up very technology uh, connected, and you know my attention span could definitely use a little bit of work. Interesting, uh, interesting coming from you. I was going to ask a question earlier, and I guess I will. We're going a little long here. I was going to ask, do you read more, or do you watch YouTube or podcasts more, social media more? Uh. I read and consume audiobooks. That's probably the two platforms I consume the most content of right now. Is um, you know reading when I'm at home, and then on the way to and from work, I listen to audiobooks. And when I've got other downtime, I listen to audiobooks. 
Um, you know, I do a little bit of video watching. I mean, we produce a ton of video content at you gurus. I mean, like tons of video content. So I have to kind of consume a lot of video content just in my, in our job at our company. So I, I don't spend a huge amount of time outside of work watching more video content. If I do, it's like, you know, Ted talks or, um, you know, I'll watch, uh, conferences or things like that, but I'd say hands down 90% of the content I consume is either in book form or audiobook form. Right. Uh, the reason why I asked that is I had a discussion this morning with someone who was talking about, they said, well, if you listen to podcasts, you read less. And what I have noticed is I used to read a lot more. And now I probably listen to podcasts, listen to books on online, uh, things of that nature. Uh, so I don't read as much because I, I get so many other ways to get the same information and faster to some extent. Mm. You can yeah, put a I book mean- on time and a half and read it faster. <laughs> And I do that a lot, right? Like if the topic's kind of like so-so for me, like and I'm not really that interested into it, I just jack it up to two or three X and just kind of yeah. cruise and, and stuff like that. But um, in terms of like sitting down and like reading a book, I still think there's uh, a little bit of enjoyment in that that tactile process and that visual process of, of letting your mind kind of escape yeah. into something. I think you still have to read just for your own mind too. It's good to mm-hmm. read, especially at night uh, in the evening when you want to sort of calm down. I think it helps me sort of break off that stimulus of having that shine in my eyes. So in tying it all together, finishing up, I want to ask you for a takeaway for our listener. What takeaway from this interview, from your experiences and background, do you have to to tell a listener? And then I'll summarize it and put it up front. (laughs) Um, So big takeaway, right? Uh, I mean, I assume if, if your listeners are mostly entrepreneurs, I think the thing that I probably spent the most time figuring out in the last couple of years is how to... Um, figure out what people really want, what they're really after. What is that finished story benefit? What is that thing that people are ultimately driving for? And figuring out a way to help them get there cheaper, faster, more efficiently, um, focusing on that desired result and making everything else the details. Because um, when I made that pivot in my business, when I started selling people really that desired result, what they were truly after, and I started to kind of look at everything else as just the details, um, we've we've experienced some really nice explosive growth um, from doing that. And so I think, you know, whether you're selling websites or courses or whatever, you know, figure out what that thing is that you're trying to get that person to do ultimately, you know, in the web world, are you trying to get them more customers or more donors? And, and then start there with that goal and then work everything backwards around that. And you're going to have a lot, you're going to create, first of all, much more meaningful relationships because, you know, people are going to thank you for helping them to do whatever that thing is, whatever that thing they had so much pain around. If you can solve that thing and, you know, do that in a way that has a 10x return, then um, I think that's that's definitely a good, a good way to think about it. And, you know, one uh, quote here from one of my uh, mentors, a guy named Bardia Hausman, uh, he said, you know, the best businesses provide 10 times the value for one tenth the cost. So when you're thinking about that, if you're going to provide $10,000 in value to your clients and, you know, at first you're like, oh, well, I'm going to charge them $1,000 for that. If you can figure out a way to charge them $100 for that and be able to provide them that $10,000 of ROI for $100, you know, that's where you start to get into those disruptive type technologies. And so that's something that I repeat over and over to myself. And I, and I always wonder, like, when we come up with a product and we're going to price it, and we're like, you know, we're like, man, this product's going to be awesome. And it's going to be $500, you know, and it's going to have $50,000 impact. Like, if we can figure out how to make that same product be $50, then that's amazing. Let's, right? let's carry this conversation over into WP Tonic if Jonathan wouldn't mind. Because that's a great conversation. How do you do pricing and where do you put it? That's a, I mean, I think about, I'm thinking about that right now because I'm getting ready for a launch in March of next year of another product. Very good. So um, it's been a wonderful time, Brent, uh, talking to you. I'm looking forward to WP Tonic. How can we get a hold of you? What's your best contact information? Websites? Yeah, so. Home um, phones. <laughs> <laughs> cell phones. Uh, you know, reach out to me on, on Twitter. That's a good place. Uh, just at Brent Weaver. Um, you can also check out our uh, brand, uh, Ugurus. It's the letter U and then gurus.com. If you're a web professional and you're interested in some of our business training, tons of free resources on that website. So probably the best two ways to reach me, just you know, just do a shout out to me on Twitter at Brent Weaver um, or uh, go to ugurus.com and um, download some of our free stuff or reach out to us through that website. Very good. And I thank you. 
So looking forward to WP Tonic. All right. Sounds good, Bill. So I'm just going to stop the recorder here and restart the recorder. And Jonathan, it's all yours. I should have had Jonathan say something at the end. Yes, I did. Jonathan, I'm still recording. Say something. Yes, I'm here, Bill. Goodbye, Jonathan. Goodbye, Bill. <laughs> Bye, Brent. <laughs> See you. Okay, I'm going to just start.